I'll try to make it interesting and uh, finish on time so that you can go out to the reception. And so, um, so I'm the maintainer of the project called WasMatch, and, uh, and we're gonna, in this talk, we're gonna talk about a new way to do microservices using two um, CNCF projects, it's called WasMatch, my project, and Dapper. So we're gonna talk about those, those projects in a minute. And uh, um, if you want my contact information, it's in the barcode above, you know, so if uh, it goes to my GitHub profile where, you know, you can see my Twitter handle and uh, email address and, you know, things like, things like that. All right, so some of you might have heard about WebAssembly, you know, so um, it's what we call WASM, you know, it's, uh, it's WebAssembly started as a browser technology. So why is it important and how it's connect to microservices? I would refer to a CNCF survey that was done about this time last year. You know, so it asked uh, a lot of IT professionals around the world, what's, come, what's the technology that's coming next? Right. You know, so the key findings, by the way, they, so this survey has only one key finding. You know, there's no other findings. You know, the key findings summarized into one sentence is containers are the new norm and the WebAssembly is the future, right? So um, as we all know, CNCF, the organization was built on the idea of containerization, which gave birth to the entire cloud native uh, movement, right? You know, so um, fast forward about 10 years now, you know, we, there's a uh, wide use of containers and uh, Kubernetes and related technologies. So what's next? And so um, I think there's a, there's a, um, a consensus among the uh, practitioners of um, um, the cloud native space that WebAssembly is, uh, is the future and, and we're gonna talk about why. So that's the WasMage project. The WasMage project is only WebAssembly runtime in the C CNCF ecosystem. So, um, the other project we want to discuss today is called Dapper. Dapper is, uh, is incubated by Microsoft and then get donated to CNCF. It's a new way to do microservices. As you can see from the uh, community metrics, it's anonymously uh, popular. It's one of the largest projects in CNCF. And uh, um, so it, there's lots of contributors, just uh, most, it's who's who in the, in, the, in, the, in the cloud native space and a lot of GitHub stars and all that. So this is one, uh, you know, uh, a, I wouldn't say a new paradigm, but codified a lot of best practices in terms of how to do large scale microservices. So those are the two projects we want to cover in our talk today. So um, the, the agenda of the talk, you know, is fairly straightforward. It's first, we want to talk about why you want to run microservices in WASM, so lightweight microservices in WASM. And the second, how does Dapper improve that experience and why it's necessary to use Dapper in toge together with WASM. And the third, we want to introduce a Dapper SDK for WASM Edge. And the fourth, we want to talk about the serverless deploy deployment. And I also give an example, serverless deployment of both WASM-based microservices and Dapper-based sidecars. Okay, so WASM as a microservice runtime. You know, so um, this is a plot that I, that I often show. You know, it, it may be a little small, but um, um, the y-axis reads from slow, it's, it's about performance. So it's lower is slow, higher is fast. The x-axis is footprint. So on the left is heavy, on the right is light. So we can see virtualization technology has gone through multiple iterations over time. So when we started, when, when uh, cloud computing first started, you know, what is cloud computing? You know, someone said, you know, I, I like the code very, very much. To say cloud is just somebody else's computer. You know, you are running your code on somebody else's computer. That is called cloud computing, right? So the key characteristics of cloud computing is, is isolation. You will be able to run your code free from interference from other people on the same hardware, right? You know, so that, keep, that is enabled by a virtual machine. Right, you know, so when Amazon have EC2, you know, when the when those cloud computing providers first come along, they were all based on virtual machines, VM based. However, people soon find that the virtual machine is a sort of heavy. You know, it needs to emulate the network, the all the hardware, the and the disk, and all that stuff, right? And it's also fairly slow. It's a large performance overhead. So um, around the time CNCF come along, you know, when uh, when you know, Docker was really popular. Container becomes the the um, the, the standard for run cloud cloud computing workloads. So that gives birth, like I said, that gives birth to the cloud native era. 
So if you ask, if people ask me, you know, what is cloud native? Cloud native is container cloud. You know, is that you know all the workloads are in containers, and then they were somehow distributed on the cloud and and then run, right? You know, so con the container error is, I think, lasted well, at least ten years until now, right? You know, that's uh, so. You now cloud computing, you know, cloud native computing becomes so prevalent that people want to use this paradigm, this type of isolation anywhere. So, for instance, you know, um, on the edge. So, for instance, in the car, you know, um, we have seen, heard a lot of talk about AGL today, automate, you know, um, automate, automated grade Linux. You know, one of the key requirements is isolation. You want to isolate the workload that's in the in the car. Can you use container for that? You may be able to do that, but it is a very heavy proposition. So, for instance, if you want to do machine learning, you know, something like that, the the uh, the PyTorch container in the car is four gigabytes each, right? You know, that's it consume a truckload of disk space and memory space. So it make, makes it a very it's not very economical to build uh, special purpose containers for those for those applications. And also, one of the other issues uh, container has is. While it's portable across operating systems, it's not, does it, it's not portable across hardware. So for instance, you know, a container image that's built for ARM processor is different than the component container image that's built for the um, uh, x86 um, processor. And let alone all the um, hardware accelerators that today we have on the edge, you know, like the GPUs, like TPUs, like NPUs, you know, there's all kinds of you know, uh, hardware accelerators that's, um, that, that we have available on the edge that's uh, not properly abstracted by the container. So, you know, so I think container has you know, um, uh, brought us to today, you know, that's where there's a prevalence of uh, cloud native computing paradigm. However, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult for, for um, you know, by using container alone to move even, to move, um, you know, um, to push this to even more computing devices. So that's where uh, WebAssembly comes in. So WebAssembly is something that is, uh, I think, orders of magnitude smaller and, or, uh, and potentially faster than containers. And, uh, and it's also provide um, a true hard, uh, hardware portability, you know, meaning that the WebAssembly application um, can run on any hardware device that's, um, that supports the WebAssembly runtime. So we, uh, we will uh, see some examples in a minute. So that's uh, what makes WebAssembly a good candidate for, um, for running microservices because um, by definition, microservices are small. You know, um, in the, um, in the, you know um, I've seen companies that has tens of thousands of microservices, not tens of, tens of thousands of servers, tens of thousands of services. And uh, um, you know, those are large scale internet companies and each of them um, uh, perform a very specific task. And uh, you want those, uh, the runtime for those microservices to be small and then to have those microservices to be able to um, uh, move across different machines, different CPUs, even different clouds, you know, sometimes on the edge, sometimes in the data center. So Wasm is a, is a, um, is a good choice for that. That's why, you know, um, people think Wasm is the future, right? Container is there. So just to give you a feel about, you know, um, so those are the two tweets that uh, that's we, we sent out. So we built, um, you know, your typical um, a, a database application and compiled it to Wasm. You know, the application was written in Rust. So um, one of the application is, uh, is a Rust client for Redis, right? You know, so you have you have a web server, and uh, um, this application provides a web server, and the application provides business logic to interact with the Redis server on the back end. So it's a very typical microservice setup, right? You know, so you can connect to that um, a service through HTTP and uh, make requests to the Redis database. So the whole thing, including the the runtime, you know, so um, as an analogous to the container image, the whole thing is. 700 kilobytes, right? You know, so going to the Wasm world, things are again being measured in kilobytes because in, if you do that um, with, a, with a container and managed by Docker, Kubernetes, the container itself would be 100 megabytes, right? You know, that's uh, it's fairly standard, you know, say uh, a Ubuntu Linux container size would be like 300 megabytes and, you know, so there's some, some uh, you know, slim Linux uh, distributions that are smaller, right? You know, but with WebAssembly, we can get all the way down to less than one megabytes. And uh, on the right side, it's the same thing. You know, that's uh, we have a Postgres uh, uh, client application. You know, so it's a very normal, um, you know, um, a web service. And you can, um, you know, you can, 
um, when you make HTTP requests against this WASM application, it connects to a Postgres database on the back end, so it can do the database read, write, delete, and you know, uh, just the regular operations. And the whole application is 800 kilobytes, right? You know, so we are going back to the world of some megabytes. And also, the applications, applications like that are completely portable across all the hardware. You know, so it doesn't matter where you want to run it on ARM, on RISC-V, uh, or if uh, we're gonna see in a minute, if you have a machine learning or AI workload, you wanna run on GPU, CPU, anything you want. You know, that's, uh, I need to be the same binary. And it can be orchestrated and it can be developed, you know, that's uh, um, with, with ease, right? You know, so that's the thing about WASM. So this is the WASM Edge project, our GitHub repository. So uh, interesting about WASM, you know, why are we, WASM Edge is a CNCF project, is that, um, you know, um, um, by, by, have, by positioning WASM as the next generation of application runtime, we need to uh, integrate into existing tooling systems. So, so WASM, through our partnership with Docker, you know, our, our project has partnership with Docker, a partnership with ContainerD, and uh, now, you know, using those uh, Podman, um, Red Hat, OpenShift, you know, using those content, uh, traditional container management tools, you can not only start Linux containers, but you can also start WASM Edge runtimes. So your workloads can run side by side with your container image, right? You know, so your, your WASM-based workload can run side by side with your Linux container. So WASM Edge has um, several, um, I think, uh, quite unique features that distinguish it from, um, you know, because WebAssembly is an is a industry standard, right? You know, so um, WASM Edge has some features that distinguish itself from, from other WebAssembly runtime, so to speak. So it provides rich support for um, application level SDKs, so meaning that you can build high performance web servers and high performance web clients through asynchronous I.O. You know, that's being built into WASM Edge. And uh, you can have integration with infrastructure services. You know, we have just the same, um, you know, you have a WASM Edge application that connect to a Redis database and also WASM Edge application that connect to a Postgres um, um, Redis key value store in the Postgres database. So um, there's a large, there's a variety of different databases and, uh, and, and storage engines that we can support um, by, um, by having their SDK ported into WASM and, and, and have them accessible through, through, uh, through a WASM Edge application. And uh, um, perhaps more interestingly, you know, that's, um, I would have a talk about this um, uh, tomorrow afternoon, is that, um, you know, there is increasingly, um, um, we've seen use cases where to use WASM Edge to run AI workloads. Um, you know, people, because without, um, you know, what's the traditional way of running AI? It's, uh, it's a Python and a PyTorch. And, uh, and PyTorch, and you bundle it into, into a, a, a Docker image, right? You know, so it has all the problems that I, I mentioned because PyTorch Docker image itself is four gigabytes. Then you have your application on it. And on top of that, you, the, the, the image has to be um, you know, tuned towards the underlying hardware. So, you know, so if the, the underlying hardware is NVIDIA GPU, it's, it's very different than say, you know, it's ARM MPU, you know, something else, right? You know, so, so you know, so, um, so you have a huge amount of work and a huge amount of asset that you have to manage by running, um, you know, a Python-based inference. And uh, um, through WASM, by integrating with, um, you know, popular machine learning frameworks, and, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, pre-processing and post-processing frameworks that's, um, that are associated with some of the most popular machine learning models, that we are able to run things like the Llama 2 large language model, um, the YOLO 5, you know, the object detection library, and uh, um, you know, the media pipe libraries. So there's a variety of different um, uh, AI and machine learning libraries that you can run in WASM that has, um, that has very low footprint. You know? So the whole thing about running the whole setup of running a Llama 2 models, for instance. Um, in, our, uh, in our case, the runtime is about 20, gig, uh, 20 megabytes, and the application itself is about two megabytes. That compared with gigabytes upon gigabytes of space that's required for PyTorch, right? You know, so, so those are the, uh, some of the typical use cases for, um, for, for WASM applications. That's why we want to run microservices, because those services are small. We want it to run anywhere. We run it on the edge, in the car, you know, um, um, you know, on the router, you know, even in the, in the door camera. So we want all those use cases, and we need a small runtime that can accommodate that, and WASM Edge is one of those things. So then enough about WASM. So how about Dapper? You know, how does that improve the WASM experience? So what's still missing? You know, I, talk, I, talk, I talked about, you know, how you can um, build microservices, you can build database connections from, um, from WASM. 
but what's missing from it? What's missing from it is although we are connecting to all the databases that, um, you know, in my previous slides, we have all those logos, but that's not nearly enough because in the cloud native ecosystem, you know, people have, if you just look at how many projects the CNCF has, how many companies there, you know, that's, I think the CNCF, the silver member and up, there's um, over a thousand companies now and each of them have a product, right? You know, so for the, uh, for, for microservices framework to be truly um, um, you know, uh, useful in that environment, you really need to integrate with a lot of those stuff. And also, the common microservices design patterns are not yet codified in WASM, meaning that's, uh, um, you know, there's very um, established ways how to run, develop and run microservices in languages like Go. But um, in WASM, you know, um, people are, uh, you know, those, those common patterns are not yet implemented, right? So, enter Dapper, you know, it's, uh, you know, so I want to spend a minute tell you why Dapper is so popular. You know, Dapper codifies uh, a very um, um, a powerful microservices um, uh, architecture pattern. It's called the sidecar. You know, meaning so the sidecar pattern means, you know, in the Kubernetes pod, you have um, application runtimes that runs in containers, right? And then you have a separate container that acts as a service provider for all those application containers. And all the um, you know uh, connections through the infrastructure services goes through that separate container. So that separate container is called a sidecar. You know, so the application container deployed over here, the sidecar deployed over here, infrastructures over there. So Dapper provides a unified um, 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 API for the sidecar. So that allows us to decouple the business logic in the microservice from the infrastructure logic that's, um, that, needs, that needs to support the business logic, right? So it provides a, um, um, a clean API that um, provides access to all those components. So for instance, the distributed lock, the key value store, um, you know, workflows and all that stuff. You know, so all those are services where your application written in different languages can use a gRPC API or HTTP API connecting them through the Dapper container. And the Dapper container um, is, itself has all those services, but you can also, um, by connecting through its service API, to have other cloud services to connect to Dapper. So for instance, um, the, the key value API in Dapper was backed by over 100 different cloud-based key value stores. So you have key value stores in AWS, you have key value stores in, in, in the Google Cloud, and you have all that, you can key value store in Dapper itself. So you know, uh, no matter which one you want to use, you can have a service API that connects to Dapper so that from the microservice point of view, all those are the same. You just need to know the Dapper API and you just configure Dapper to go to, um, you know, you, you just tell Dapper that I, I need to save this key value pair. And the Dapper would, uh, you know, would read this configuration file and figure out whether it's gonna go to AWS to save it or a uh, local file to save it or a secret file or vault to save it, you know, something like that, right? You know, so it is a, it is a, um, so it's implements, it's basically codifies and implements a sidecar pattern and it's a very powerful way of, you know, um, of um, uh, isolating the business logic in the, um, in the microservice with, uh, from the infrastructure logics that's, um, that's the, the, the cloud provides, right? So the Dapper value, um, value proposition to Wasm is really, you know, because Wasm is light and uh, fast and portable, right? But it lacks functionality because it doesn't have 10 years to develop all those cloud native ecosystem yet. So what Dapper does is that to say, don't build drivers for all those individual database and key value store or and cloud services individually. Just build a connector to Dapper. And uh, through Dapper, you're gonna access to all those um, um, other cloud services. So that's the, um, you know, the, the collaboration between uh, started with our two projects about, um, I think a year and a half ago, right? You know, that's, uh, so we talked about that. We, we also have, you know, because um, um, for, for the Dapper project, they want uh, uh, a new lightweight approach to run microservices. And for us, we want our microservices, wasm based microservices to have access to all the um, infrastructures that's the, the um, the cloud has to offer, right? Without having to build hundreds of database drivers and connectors ourselves into Wasm, right? You know, so so um, it is really because of this um, a separation between the, the the business logic and the infrastructure logic that makes it possible, right? So um, again, there's lots of Dapper components. You know, um, 
I think I talked about that. You know, that's uh, so it's uh, it's divided into categories, and you know, each category, you know, each of those components has a lot of backing services that you can you can choose and pick, right? You know, so a real world scenario is uh, say, you know, um, so it's um, high throughput messaging processing. You know, so um, that's a typical use case is to say, if you have a um, uh, if you have a financial services firm where you have you know, um, um, you know, you have say. Uh, market signal from uh, from exchange and also um, uh, news and other signals from another source and you combine them together into a data stream and then you have to process the data stream in uh, in high speed and then um, have the result and 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 then make trading decisions to go back to uh, to execute the traders for instance some bad news happened with a company and uh, now you detect that so you, so you need to go there direct uh, immediately and uh, and short that stock, right? You know, so so there's um, you know in high speed trading scenario where you know you typically have a setup like this where you need a you need a messaging queue that's um, you know to process those messages at real time. And once you process those messages, you need to get them you need to get them back. But instead of having say a Kafka or a messaging queue or full, fully featured messaging queue inside your Wasm application, you can connect to Dapper and have Dapper connect to a, a pop sub service. Uh, you know that's. Uh, that would be able to process your message, um, you know, um, 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 asynchronously, right? You know, this is one of, um, um, you know, use cases from uh, from our, one of our customers. So, yeah. So then, you know, that's so. The next step becomes very um, very obvious. Is that now we want to um, because we've seen the benefits, you know, um, of was connecting Wasm to Dapper. So, what is a piece of software that actually does that? So the software is called Dapper SDK for Wasm Edge, you know, Dapper SDK for Wasm, right? You know, so it basically provides, um, it, it is a Rust Quate or a library where you can import into your, um, into your microservice project. And when you compile your microservice into Wasm, it would, uh, um, you know, the SDK would be compiled into it. It would give you a high level API where you can manipulate objects by uh, instantiating uh, a, a connector object to Dapper and then call the functions on top of it, right? You know, so this is um, uh, a Dapper side um, a sandbox project, meaning that's you know Dapper, Dapper is a large open source project by itself. So they have their own um, uh, incubation program that has a sandbox. So we contributed that um, this particular driver to their sandbox project. Uh, yeah, so that's basically the same plot that uh, that I've shown. You know, that uh, all the components in Dapper would be uh, would be supported by this through this SDK. So um, I wouldn't actually run this demo application because this demo application it takes like ten minutes to start up and actually and fully run. You know, so but this is this would be a very typical um, you know um, um, microservice application. So so you can see. What this one does is that it's an image processing application. It utilizes the uh, AI capabilities in Wasm Edge. So you know, so it takes the AI model and uh, and and create a web interface. So where you can upload a picture, and then by looking at um, you know by using the AI model to process the picture, it's gonna give uh, it's gonna tell you what's the what the picture is, right? But it, at the same time, it's gonna generate, say, um, observability data or logging data, events data, that would be saved into database, right? So um, what we do here is a very, I think a very common microservice pattern is to decouple those features, you know, so the image uh, classifier or the image grayscale, you know, those image services are in their own microservices. But the event logging is only, it's also in its own microservices and the events logging service connects to the MySQL database that saves, uh, that uh, saves the logs, right? And the image classifier and image grayscale services connect to the AI models, right? So what it does is that um, you can see um, all those, because uh, imagine if you don't have Dapper in the middle. If you don't have Dapper in the middle, you would have, uh, you would have n times n complexity, n squared complexity, because each service needs to call the other service. So you need to know where's the IP address or the port number that the service is running, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and then know what's the interface um, you are expected to, to, um, to, to deal with, right? You know? So for three services, it's fine. It's only nine combinations. But imagine, you know, um, like I just mentioned, there's a, a large internet company that we work with has 50,000 microservices in their system, okay? 50,000 microservices. And each time you load a new page on their website, 
it's hundreds of microservices get triggered. You know, some of them doing predictive anal analytics, sometimes some of them doing um, ads, you know, uh, uh, advertisement serving and, you know, things like that. That, uh, if you, the N square of this is a tremendous number of, you know, potential combinations and where to find those services, right, you know. So what this, um, what Dapper does is that now, instead of each service looking for its, um, you know, its um, consumers or, 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 you know, so, so for instance, image classifier needs to look for events, and events needs to look for image class, classifier. We need none of those because image classifier is connected to a diaper sidecar, and uh, each of the microservice connects to its own diaper sidecar, and the diaper sidecar automatically forms a network on its own, and uh, so the image classifier just need to tell the, its own diaper sidecar that I need to find the event service and send some data to it. it its diaper sidecar would be able to find the event service diaper sidecar and communicate with that, right? You know, so that's the way of um, decoupling and isolation is that all the communication and all the, you know, um, finding, binding, and, you know, and so um, all, all the dirty work, so to speak, you know, was handled by the sidecar. And then, you know, um, the, the logic in the microservices becomes um, uh, fairly simple. You know, the microservices just say, I need to find an event service. And then the diaper side car goes to find, to actually find it. You know, where does it find it? You know, it's, uh, it's, um, it does it all on its own, right? You know, so that's, um, um, so, but you can, if you're interested, there's a GitHub repository. You know, there's, uh, there are instructions on how to set it up because as you can see, you need, uh, um, you need three diaper containers and uh, um, those, uh, uh, green ones are, are water mesh containers, you know, so you need a cluster of um, uh, six containers and the, also the uh, MySQL database, that's seventh container. So you, so you, you need to um, set up all those and, 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 and have it around. That's why it takes 10 minutes to, to, to compile and start up, right? You know, so we have a GitHub action that you can go there and see, you know, that's all the steps, you know, that's um, involved in deploying something like that, right? So, you know, uh, if you do get it set up, it, um, you know, um, it would provide a, a web interface like this where you can upload a picture and it would, uh, it would use the ImageNet model to detect what it is and then tell you, you know, what's, um, you know, you can, you can, you know, here obviously I give it a rust crab. You know, that's, but, you know, you can, um, you can have, say, a hamburger, you know, or a hot dog, you know, whatever, you know, that's, so it's, it is pretty interesting to see the, um, you know, the machine learning work that's in progress. So, but that's the complex story. But there's a silver lining. There's a, there's an easier way to do all this. You know, what we call a serverless WASM and a serverless dapper, because I think the going forward, um, microservices become increasingly serverless, meaning that you don't really need to think about where it's deployed, how it's get done, you know, you just, send it to some machine and some service and ask the service to run for you, right? So fortunately for us, Wasm and the Dapper are both, now, now both have serverless, um, you know, serverless platform available for that, right? You know, so to run Wasm as a serverless function, it's, a, it's a something called the Flowstone network where you can just upload a Wasm function and it will run it for you. And for Dapper, it is, uh, it is uh, Diagrid Catalyst. You know, Diagrid is the company behind Dapper. You know, they are essentially the spin off from Microsoft, right? You know, so basically they provide Dapper as a service, meaning that they provide all the, the key value store API, the PubSub API, the things that we talked about as internet APIs. So you can set up a key value store in their system and then use the, um, you know, um, and then access through the API. And by configuring what's the backend key value store should be corresponding to an API, you would be able to save it to say AWS or something else, right? It allows you to do the multi-cloud and edge cloud type of thing. So both of, the, so both of those services are serverless. And uh, so I want to give you a, a very quick demo in terms of um, a whole application that we, we built in a couple of minutes. You know, that's, uh, um, so the, the GitHub repository is this Catalyst the Telegram OpenAI. It's, what it does is that build a Telegram bot that answers, um, that takes user input. So the service is a Telegram bot. So when you type something in your Telegram bot, it sends to the service. The service use OpenAI to generate answers and then use Dapper to do state management. So let's look at how it works. You know, it is a little small, so you know. So the first question I ask is, what is a container? 
So if you ask what is a container to a regular person, the person gonna tell you this, it's a, it's a glass box, you know, something like that. But it's not, you know, the, it actually gave a very elaborate answer is what is the container in the, in, the, in, the, in the context of a cloud native computing. It tells you it's a software container, it's a software runtime. You know why? Because we have trained the model to say that, right? You know, so I, I, I ask another question, can I give it, can I get it in the store? And the answer is no, you can get it in the con container repository, right? You know, so the model is very fine tuned to answer um, um, cloud native questions. And then the last question I asked is how it's related to Kubernetes. So it's also give a very comprehensive answer, right? You know, so it is, uh, um, you know, in my opinion, it is obviously a fairly useful bot, right? <laughs> you know, that's uh, um, because, you know, um, as you can imagine, it can answer, you know, and if you are doing, say, Kubernetes exams, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, it can answer a lot of those questions. So how did we build it? You know, that's, uh, um, I'm almost done. There's four screens here, you know, so the first, Really is that um, you know all, all the code is written in Rust and compiled to to, um, to WebAssembly. And if you scan the PR code, you can you can get to the GitHub repository. So the first really is to um, you know the undeploy is um, is a function that defined by the serverless function platform to say when the when the function is first deployed on the platform, call this call this function. What it does is that it's listen to the update from the Telegram API, right? You know when it receives um, a message from a bot that had been identified by the Telegram, um, Telegram token, it will call the handler method. What the handler method does is that retrieves the message that is associated with this update, and then it goes to the next. Then what it does is that it needs to, um, because this serverless function connects to a, a, a Telegram bot, there may be a lot of people using the Telegram bot at the same time, right? You know, so it can, can get all kinds of different questions from different users. Um, there has to be a state management element on the um, on, uh, on the serverless function side, on the uh, on the application side, where you know you can associate this user and uh, to this thread, right? You know, so this is actually done through the Dapper API, through the Catalyst client. You know, so there's a key value store where um, I get the chat ID from the Telegram, which basically identifies the user that's uh, sending this message, and I keep that, map that to an OpenAI thread ID. You know, so that on the OpenAI side, I know which com which conversation thread I'm running with this user, right? You know, so this is a very very simple example. So we, um, you know, if if I don't have that set up already, I, I create a thread ID and then save it. If I do, if I match it to a to a thread ID, I would just uh, take the thread ID and go to OpenAI, and then ask the OpenAI to come up with the answer. So this is the OpenAI SDK that is uh, that's um, that we write in Wasm. Um, in, in, uh, it was a match, right? You know, so the create network a message request is sent to the thread ID, and uh, the also in, the other interesting thing is that you can see there's a system ID. It's use the latest features of OpenAI, where you can create, um, you know, a special knowledge assistant, meaning that you can customize ChatGPT for a specific domain to give it a special prompt and to give it special context by uploading some data. So what we did is that we uploaded some, cable, um, you know, uh, Kubernetes-related content to this particular system ID, so that whenever it sees a question it try to answer it as a cloud native question, right? You know, so the example you can see is that what is a container? It doesn't tell you what's the co common sense definition of a container. It tells you what's the cloud native definition of the container is, right? So, you know, so that's um, to ask OpenAI Assistant. It's just a bunch of API calls. And then once you get the answer, it's, uh, um, it's uh, um, um, you know, it goes to the key value store and then find out where the, 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 the chat ID is and send it back to the the Telegram API, so that completes the entire application. And um, uh, if you want to try the bot, you know, that's you can, you, um, you know, if you have a, t a Telegram, you can just uh, um, uh, scan the barcode and it's in a GitHub repository, you can, you can chat with it right now, right? So, um, well, that's the last slide, you know, so um, here we've seen, you know, um, 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 running microservice as um, using Wasm to run microservice and how Dapper helps connecting those lightweight Wasm microservices, giving more features to those microservices to all the uh, cloud native infrastructure components. And also, we've also seen the, microserv uh, the Wasm microservice can also connect to a large language model like OpenAI, right? However, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's another dimension to it, you know, is that, um, you know, Wasm Edge is actually one of the leaders in faster than portable runtimes for open source LLMs, meaning that you can use Wasm Edge to, instead of Python to 
as a runtime container to run a large language model like Llama 2 or stable diffusion or you know um, a variety of different you know uh, TensorFlow models like we have just seen you know image recognition models and you know things like that. So those model applications could be written in, uh, and compiled into a a, a Watson based microservices, right? You know, so here are two links that we showed. You know, there's a large variety of different language models, and. Uh, so once you run those in, uh, um, in, in Wasm Edge as a microservice, you can provide it to, as a service. You can provide the LLM function as a, as a service to other microservices in your ecosystem. And how do you do that? You can use Dapper for it, right? You know, because each, micro, uh, because each um, AI model and each large language model could have a different API, could have different prompt template. You know, there are lots of things that are different. But we can have a unified API like the Dapper key value store to hide away all those complexities of what the underlying model is actually doing. So you know, so so you can have a you can have a new um, Dapper API that is called Chat or large language model, and have all the, um, and uh, um, have any model open source or proprietary be able to plug into that and uh, unplug that as a Dapper service as well. So you know, so yeah, that's uh, um, but that's obviously has not been done. You know, that's uh, um, that's something that's um, you know um, will do. That's um, um, uh, perhaps in the near future. So, yeah, that's it for my talk. And uh, you know, um, I I hope we, um, you know I know we're gonna have the reception in a minute. But uh, I I really do hope that you can you know um, go out and try Wasm Edge, try Dapper, and you know uh, create your own microservice, so create your own chatbot, right? You know, that's. Uh, and uh, um, have some fun. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.